They're going to continue. We stopped uh, on Monday. While closing on Monday, uh, we closed with the first chapter of First Timothy. And uh, we, I was talking about how uh, Paul wrote Timothy and said not to neglect faith and a good conscience. And some have rejected these and have shipwrecked their faith. And he goes on to say, among them are Hymenes and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. And the first chapter closes with this particular uh, word, this particular sentence. And after the Bible study on Monday, I got a couple of questions on chat, uh, not on chat, on, on WhatsApp. Uh, two questions, basically. Uh, one was, who is Paul to hand over someone to Satan? And number two, how can Satan teach someone not to blaspheme? Actually, other other side, he is, he is the one who teaches people to blaspheme. So how can Satan teach someone not to blaspheme? So I'm going to first answer these two questions before I go on to the second chapter. First of all, let's remember that in the, in the Bible, you find many times God himself you know, handed over people uh, to Satan. And in fact, every attack of the enemy is only allowed by God. Without God allowing it to not happen. A typical example is Job, where the Lord first told Job, in chapter 1, verse 12, very well, you can have his possessions. When Job, when uh, Satan challenged God and said, Job is faithful to you because you put a hedge around him, you blessed him, that's why he's faithful to you. You, uh, you attack his uh, possessions, you touch his possessions, and then he will curse you to your face. And the Lord tells uh, uh, Satan, very well, you can have his possessions. And instead of uh, cursing uh, God, Job actually fell down and worshipped God. Then second time, again God was so happy with Job, he boasted of, about Job to Satan. And this time, again, uh, uh, Satan is challenging God. You know, oh, you, his skin for, skin for sin, for skin, and if you touch his life, then his uh, body, then he again curse you. And again, God says in second chapter of 6, very well, uh, you, have, you can have him, but don't uh, kill him. Don't uh, attack his life. So God actually handed over uh, Job to Satan. So as an apostle of Christ, the apostle Paul also had authority, authority to build people up, not to tear them down. And he handed over him, Alexander Hemius to be taught not to blaspheme. So they will learn not to blaspheme and come back to God. Now, the teaching on not blaspheming God is not given by Satan. It's just that when this man, these two people were handed over to Satan, the experience they were going to have, the experience they were going to have at the hands of Satan was going to be so bad, those experiences will teach them not to blaspheme God. When someone is, you know, playing, the devil plays around with somebody, will have such bad experiences that those experiences will teach us not to blaspheme God. So actually, Paul had authority as the apostle of Christ. And in 2 Corinthians 10, 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 8, also 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 10, uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 10, Paul uh, writes about how he was given authority to build people up, not to tear them down. And in fact, in the church in Corinth, in the first chapter of, uh, first letter of Paul to Corinthians, chapter 5, the first few verses, uh, we read about how a certain man had his father's wife, which means his stepmother. The church was actually proud about it. And Paul, how can you be proud about it? Put this man out completely. Put him out. Out of the church, in fact. And later on, we find 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 6 to 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 6 to 8. Paul writes to the same church and says, the punishment inflicted upon him by the majority is sufficient for him. We put him out as enough punishment. Now forgive him, comfort him, and reaffirm your love for him. Forgive him, comfort him, reaffirm your love for him. And then he goes on to say in verse 11, for we're not unaware of the devil's schemes. Once a person put out of the church and devil's hands, he'll play around. We know his plans. When this man repents, forgive him, comfort him, reaffirm your love for him. In the same way, in the case of I mean, Alexander, I can imagine, after giving more to Satan, when the circumstances he faces because of being under Satan's control or influence, is so bad, 
They were taught not to blaspheme and taken back to the fellowship. Once he has learned not to blaspheme, take him back. That's, a, that's the, uh, the, the context of this particular verse. Satan won't teach us not to blaspheme, but the circumstances, experience you have when you are troubled by Satan will teach you not to blaspheme. And Paul being an apostle, had authority, ultimately to build people up, not to tear them down. Once they repent and learn their mistakes, bring them back. Forgive them, comfort them, reaffirm your love for them. They will not be owned by excessive sorrow. Let's go on to the second chapter. It's very good. Very, very interesting, these few verses. I'm going to spend time on these few verses. Uh, first Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 onwards. Paul writes, I urge then, first of all, the requests, prayers, intercession, and thanks be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority. They may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. He's exhorting Timothy, in fact, to encourage the members of the church in Ephesus also, to start praying for people in authority, over in kings, meaning the leadership, everybody around, intercessory prayer. That as you pray for the leaders and God changes them, you can live peaceful and godly lives while living in, in, the, in Ephesus. And then he said, this peace is God who wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, one of the reasons why people don't pray for the leaders is because they feel the leaders are so bad, so corrupt, so evil people. What's the point in praying for them? We forget one thing, that before a person turns to Christ, he or she is under the control of the evil one. And we think these people are not worth praying for. They're so bad, not worth praying for. We don't realize that unless a person is in Christ, he can do nothing. He cannot really live a holy life. John 15, 5, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And people think, that a godly person will find the truth. That's a normal thing in our country also. If you're godly, you'll find the truth. And these people don't, are not godly. They are evil people. What's upon praying for them? How can they know the truth? The fact is, it is not godliness that will help you find the truth. It is not the truth that leads to godliness. It is the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. The other way around. Titus chapter 1 verse 1 says that. Titus chapter 1 verse 1. The knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. So people who are in authority, who are ungodly people, corrupt people, if you don't feel like praying for them, but you pray for them. He pleases God. He wants them to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Alataya. Alataya means truth. And the word alataya for truth used here, the same word used in John chapter 14 verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A, -E Alataya. A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A, -E Alataya is the truth. Yes, it says, pray, they'll be saved. God wants all men to be saved, including your leaders, corrupt people, terrible people who are in authority, who are mess messing up the country. Pray for them. He, God wants them to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Alataya. The truth is Jesus. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Again, Alathaya. Titus 1, 1, again, Alathaya. Knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. So we have to pray for our leaders that they'll come to know Jesus. How many of us pray like that? We pray for them to be punished. Lord, the terrible people, punish them. They should learn a lesson. I say, they can't live a holy life. They can't govern properly unless they look to me. I want them saved. The will of God, the heart of God is all people to be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9. Doesn't want anyone to perish, all to come to repentance. So we have to pray for our leaders. And once they come to power, we pray for them. Now, whom, who's going to come to power is not in our hands. 13 chapter Romans, the first few verses say, there's no authority except that instituted by God. There is no authority except that instituted by God. What authority that exists is appointed by God. 
And therefore, who was in power today, remember, God brought them to power. They may be ungodly people, but we have to pray for them to know the truth. That's why I don't advise God who he should bring as leaders. When elections come, I don't pray who should get elected. That's God's doing. We are not God's political advisors. He knows whom to put. Whoever comes to power, we pray for them. First and foremost, they'll be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Let's go on to here. Verse 5. For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself the ransom for all men, the testimony given the proper time. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The word God here is Theos. Theos. And from the word Theos, we get the word theology. Theology means study of God. Whenever you find the word ology, ology, it means it's actually a study of what comes before that. Like zoology, study of animals. Biology, study of the human body. Pharmacology, study of medicine. Psychology, study of the mind, psyche. So theology is what? Study of God. Theos is God. The one God, Theos, and one mediator between God and men. Men is anthropos. Anthropology is study of mankind. So Theos, theology, anthropos, anthropology. Now, between God and men, there is one mediator. And this mediator means reconciler. One reconciler between God and men, that is Christ. Now, when two entities separate, if there has to be a reconciler, the reconciler mediator must be accepted by both parties. Otherwise, there's no reconciliation. There's no mediation. But in God and men, if there has to be a reconciler mediator, this reconciler, meritus is the Greek word, M-E-R-I-T-E-I-S, meritus, reconciler, mediator. This reconciler must be accepted by both parties. There's no reconciliation, no mediation. If India and Pakistan are not in good terms, America wants to mediate, bring them together. Unless India and Pakistan both accept USA as mediator, there's no mediation. And India says, no, this matter is bilateral. No one come and put in. You can't mediate. Bilateral. We will deal with Pakistan directly, not you. No mediator. You won't accept them as mediators. But in God and men, one mediator. Only one. Jesus Christ. Now, he is accepted by God the Father because his life was sinless. In him there was no sin. That's why his sacrifice on the cross was sufficient for our sins. When man accepts Christ, anthropos, when human beings accept Christ as their savior, both accept, then reconciliation. And it says here, one meeting between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. It specifies man Christ Jesus. He is both fully God, fully man. Why man Christ Jesus? Man has flesh and blood. God is spirit, doesn't have flesh and blood. God became man. Christ is fully God, fully man. And what is mentioned here? Man Christ Jesus because he had a body of flesh and blood. And that flesh and blood body was sacrificed on the cross as a payment for the sins of the whole world. As a ransom for men. Ransom. Now, the word ransom, again, the word for ransom actually means redemption price. Redemption price. Now, whenever the ransom paid to redeem somebody, to whom is it paid? Take, for example, a, a, a person, a rich man, whose son is kidnapped by a kidnapper. Rich man has a son, child, kidnapped. And then the kidnapper, after kidnapping the child, sends a message to the parents. I want uh, uh, 10 lakh rupees. 
then I'll give back the child. So the parents of the child pay a ransom, redemption price to the kidnapper to redeem the child back from the kidnapper. Okay. Now let's go back to Christ. Ransom. He's a ransom for our sins. Now, if he's a ransom, to who was the ransom prayed? His body was crucified on the cross. By his blood, the blood was a payment for the sins of the whole world. The man Christ Jesus, the body, flesh and blood body. After living a sinless life, he offered his body on the cross. To whom was that ransom paid? Who was the kidnapper? Kidnapper is devil. He, he stole man from God. Fellowship with God, which man had stole it. Was a ransom paid to devil? No. So, no. Who was it paid for? Paid to. Psalm 49, 7 to 9. Psalm 49, verses 7 to 9. No man can redeem the life of another man. Or give to God a ransom for life. A ransom for life is too costly. No payment is ever enough. The man can go on forever and not see, see decay. His ransom was paid to God, rather, to fulfill the righteous requirements of God. God, the just God. He's a God of justice. And justice demands the sin must be paid for. He's just God. He doesn't, doesn't change. Sin must be paid for. And without payment of sin, there's no forgiveness of sins. In fact, it says in Hebrews 9.22, Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So blood had to be shed. Not the blood of animals, not the blood of human beings, but the blood of the sinless Son of God. So Christ's sacrifice by the man Christ Jesus, body of flesh and blood, was made as a payment to fulfill the righteous requirements of God. On the cross, he said, it is finished. It is finished. So he's a ransom for our sins. He gave himself for us. And by his blood, he's made our, our spirits perfect. And therefore, Theos and Anthropos, God and man are reconciled. We are peace with God. That is why he is the only way of salvation. His life is the only sinless life ever lived on this earth. So let's go back to the fifth verse. For the one God, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. He gave himself as a ransom, redemption price for all men, the testimony given in his proper time. What testimony is this? Testimony. Now, we look at Romans chapter 3, from verse 20, it says that nobody can be righteous before God by keeping the law. Through the law, we become conscious of sin. For in the gospel, righteousness from God are from, has been revealed, to which the law and the prophets testify. The law and the prophets testify to this righteousness that comes from God, that is Christ. Christ is our righteousness. His righteousness that comes from God. That's why in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord told the people, seek his kingdom and his righteousness, not your righteousness. By trying to be uh, keeping the law, you'll never be righteous. No one is justified by keeping the law. Through the law, we become conscious of sin. But now, after the cross, Paul writes, righteousness from God has been revealed. To which the law and the prophets testify. The law testifies to Jesus. The prophets testify to Jesus. Testimony given in his proper time. Now the law you find in the, when Jesus spoke to the Jews in John 5 39 he says John chapter 5 verse 39 you diligently study scriptures because you think by them you have eternal life. These scriptures testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. The entire Old Testament law 
testifies to the Messiah. The law and the prophets testify. Every prophet spoke about forgiveness of sins through Jesus. When Peter spoke the household of Cornelius, Acts 10, 43, Acts chapter 10, verse 43, he says, all the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. Lord testifies to Jesus, the prophets testify to Jesus. To the righteousness that comes from God. Not man's righteousness, but God's righteousness. And here Paul, Paul writes to Timothy, the testimony, that is Jesus, given in his proper time, is a particular point of time when the Messiah would enter the world. He was chosen as the Savior long before man actually was created. From the foundation of the world, he was chosen. 1 Peter 1.20 1 Peter 1.20 says, the Lamb of God chosen from the foundation of the world. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, 9 and 10, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 9 and 10, Paul writes to Timothy again, we'll come back to the second letter of Paul Timothy, about the grace of God. This grace was given us before the beginning of time, but now been revealed to the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now has been revealed Chosen long time ago from the foundation of the world. Before the beginning of time, he was chosen, earmarked, to be sent to the world as a payment for sin. But now revealed the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Testimony is Jesus, given at the proper time, who is the ransom for all men, for all anthropos, every human being, and between God and man, one mediator. This media has to be accepted by both parties. That's why we pray with people for them to accept Christ as Savior and Lord. He's accepted by God the Father because his life was sinless. He was my son whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. He's accepted God as the only Savior of the whole world. Unless people of this world, men, men, men meaning male and female, anthropos accept him, there's no mediation, there's no reconciliation. And actually, this particular verse, uh, 1 Timothy 2 5, is a tremendous verse to answer the questions that our people in our country have. People from our old religion, forefathers' religion, they believe God is Paramatma, highest spirit. We have a human spirit called Jivatma. And Paramatma and Jivatma separated. And the whole purpose of life is. How I can find union with the Paramatma? How I can be one with him? And 1 Timothy 2.5 gives the answer. There's one God, one million people in God and men. The man Christ Jesus. The man Christ Jesus, because the body of flesh and blood was given for him to come and live in. He sacrificed that body on the cross. And you'll find that because of that, today we have salvation. The testimony of the law and the prophets given at the proper time. The time was when he entered the world. It says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. Galatians chapter 4, 4 and 5. When the time had fully come, testimony given at the proper time, the time had fully come, God sent to son, born of woman, born under the law, we may receive the full rights as sons. This time came 2,000 years ago. Chosen from the foundation of the world, reveals the right time, and today he is waiting for, God is waiting for all men, all anthropos, to be reconciled to Theos, God, through the mediator who is a ransom for all men. He paid the price for our sins. He fulfilled the righteous requirements of God. And since sin has been paid for, we don't have to pay for our sins anymore. Receive this gift, enjoy this gift, and live for him every moment of our lives. I don't have time, but I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to give a re references for God, Jesus being fully God and fully man. Fully God, fully man. All the verses that talk about him being divine, verses that talk about him being a human. Basically, he had he was thirsty, he was hungry, he was tired. 
temptation, temptation was shown to him. So he was fully man, fully God. And the man Christ Jesus offered his body on the cross as his payment for the whole world. And therefore, he is the only way of salvation. Uh, I'll first of all talk about Jesus being God. Uh, Isaiah 7.14. Isaiah 7.14. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Isaiah 9 6. John 1 1. John chapter 1 verse 1. Philippians chapter 2 verse 6. Philippians chapter 2 verse 6. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 to 3. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 to 3. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. Titus chapter 2 verse 13. Titus 2 13. This is about Jesus being God. About him being man. He was thirsty. John 19 28. John 19 20. He was thirsty. He was hungry. Matthew chapter 4 verse 2. Matthew chapter 4 verse 2. He was hungry. He was tired. John chapter 4 verse 6. John chapter 4 verse 6. He was tired being human. He had a body. And he could be shown temptations. He never yielded to temptation. But devil tried to tempt him. Being human, he was tempted everywhere just as we are. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. So being human, he was tired. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He could be tempted. Never yielded to temptation. Sinless he was. So he's fully God, fully man. And I said, the man Christ Jesus became a ransom for us because that body was sacrificed for you and me on the cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for each one of us, Lord. Thank you, Master, for amazing grace, Lord. You sent the mediator, Lord, to reconcile us to you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, you have paid the ransom for our sins. At the appropriate time you enter the world, Lord, the law and the prophet testify about you, Lord. The time had fully come, you came, Lord, and now we can enjoy this new life, Lord. We are reconciled to you, Lord. And I thank and praise you, Lord, as a faithful to this gospel, Lord. Use us for your glory, Lord. Let many people be reconciled to you, Lord, Father, to Jesus. Lord, help us instrument, be instruments in your hands, Lord, for salvation of people, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.